too smooth that mud talking to have your ass in a wreck. You signing your check, pussy better do what he says. We shutting down shows, ain't gotta put no price in your head. Man, I'm coming for your tongue for all that shit that you said. Another episode, another profile, Gunner's Profiles, yeah, yo. Ba -ba -ba -yo. Yeah, yo. All right, man. We're going to get straight into it in a correct fashion and man noodle style. Let's do this. Another profile. Okay, today, what I wanted to talk about is another individual from the streets that not a lot of people know about. <clears throat> See, <clears throat> I want to bring you some of these individuals right here on Gunner's Profiles that not a lot of people talk about, not a lot of people have heard about. But real thugs, real ones doing real things and have done it in real life. You see, this is a big world we live in. And everybody knows those central figures that play a big part into history. The Pancho Villas, you know, uh, the Joaquin Mulleta, the, the, you know, whoever, this and that. So the Al Pacinos. We all know about these individuals, but at the same time, in the meantime, in between time, there's those that fly under the radar. Or those that are hood certified and street known. Okay, not a lot of people know about them and their stories never get told. And there's a reasoning for that. There's a reasoning for that. A lot of these guys wanted it that way or they wanted to fly under the radar or in the meantime, in between time, they just didn't get the recognition they deserved. Now, I'm not going to say that all these individuals that I profile on this direct channel it are um, worthy of being some type of notorious figure or trophy in the game game, prison game, um, any type of game. But at the same time, I thought that if for no other reason, I should do just something a little bit different, bring you just a little bit rawness and grittiness uh, to this genre, you know, so that way you know that everyone needs to have their voice felt, needs to be heard, and needs to be responsible for the intricate part that they played in the historia of Chicanoism or people, period, okay? So with, the, with that being said, the next person we're going to talk about on Gunner's Profiles is a guy named Sal Flores, okay? And he actually has a brother named, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> My voice is fucked up. He actually has a brother named Max Flores as well, who actually played just about the same part. But Sal being the older brother in this game is the one that I want to focus on. As you can tell by that thumbnail right there, that's Sal doing this. Okay? Um, and he is actually the Vato, the one solely responsibly for establishing the upstate Sureños in Atwater. The city of Atwater, okay? Now, I've spoke on Atwater, on Gunners Collective yesterday, the beef between Atwater and Levos, and yes, oh, oh, you didn't, the wind was blowing, and it was real, and it continues to be real up and down Walnut Street. Um, but I will say this, this guy, Sal Flores, um, is probably the biggest catalyst into A-Town and how it was able to establish and why. And that's just because of the tenaciousness, the viciousness, the veracity the, of his character, this guy did not play and he had a hatred for the North um, by far, probably more than I've ever seen anyone have one. Okay, so there's a lot of you youngsters right now saying, so I don't like Norteños either. Uh, not like Sal did it, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he had reasons. Okay, so let's let's talk about him. Um, Sal Flores, his parents come from Mexico. Okay, they come from Mexico, so he's a second generation Mexicano. And of course, when he first immigrated into the United States, his family set up shop in Long Beach, California. Okay, and as a teenager in Long Beach, California is where he started to grip his ideas of surrenuism and gang mannerisms, right? Now, Sal and Max Flores, I like to include his brother because his brother was also with the business, right? Um, grew up simultaneously side by side. They're a couple years apart. So Sal always had to be the big brother. But unlike me or you or several other people who would want your brother out of the mix, he wanted and invited his brother into the mix. You know, so they got involved in street gangs, but not like you would think. Being Mexicanos, you would think that they were like right off the top, Surrenos on mine, right? Charlie, this is this is was not what was was to be. They actually moved into a predominantly African Africano neighborhood, um, which were Crips, which were insane on insane, cuz right, we were, were insane Crips out of the Long Beach area. So they grew up in that neighborhood to about their teenage years when their father got a job and got relocated to Merced, California. Okay. Of course, getting a job in Merced, California, it was more expensive than to live in a smaller city, which was also known as Atwater, California, which is about 10 minutes away from Merced. So his family set up shop in Atwater. Okay, coming to Atwater at that time, we're talking about early, early 80s. The gangs weren't really there. It was just a smaller city, a smaller town, 
and wasn't quite gang related. Now you had Merced on the side that was already active in the bunch and we were wiggling, right? And then of course you had Turlock, Modesto and Stockton that way. And these cities were also known to have a deep history rooted in Northenuism as far as gang related shit goes. Um, but Atwater was kind of left alone because there was nothing there at this particular time. Wasn't very many stores, wasn't no Hollies, um, shit, wasn't no nothing, right? Um, so moving to this little town, it was wide open. Now coming with that mentality from Long Beach, these guys had grew up Max and South Floors in a gang related area. So all they knew were gangs. You know, all they seen and breathed and slept and ate were gangs. So coming to a little small town like this, of course, they're going to establish. Okay, because they still wanted to live that lifestyle. They still wanted to be about that gangsterism. Let's get a hey, gangster shit. You know what I mean? They wanted to be with that. Okay, so the wind was blowing precisely the way they wanted it to, and everything fell in according to plan. There was a lot of Chicanos and Mexicano families that lived in Atwater at this time because a lot of their family members worked in the fields. So these guys seen the perfect opportunity to indoctrinate some of these youngsters around them. Now, you got to understand they were only teenagers, but these guys actually were very big individuals. They had some size on them. And that's the characteristics of Max and South Flores out of Atwater that everyone knows was they were some big boys. So they were intimidating. When you would see them, they would cruise by in their low riders. And it was like, OK, there's Max and South. I remember they had a 63 uh, till green with the Mexican flag. It says ran you on. I mean, they were just with that business and they never um, hid. They never backed up from anyone. They were always down and always ready to regulate and handle their business. Um, so my own primo, one of my primos, we're not going to speak his name, but my primo actually started to hang around with these guys in junior high school. You know, so I, my grandmother's house, I'd be kicking back with Banyu. He thought, oh my, I was a little kid, like eight or nine years old. I already thought I was a gang related individual. Um, and I was right. But I'd be kicking back right there on the on the uh, couch and hear them talk and they'd be saying, oh, I'm insane because this is insane. So they actually started to indoctrinate these youngsters around them into becoming Crips. Oh, yes, this is your history, Atwater. Um, and they were insane Crips for a little time. And then as time passed, one day I seen my cousin wearing a sweater and it says, Surreno. And I said, what I live? What's that? Right. Because I had only seen Colors to this point and a few other movies, uh, Boulevard Nights, things of that nature. I didn't really know about Los LA area, San Diego, IE, I didn't know about the Sul too much, right? Only what I was being taught in movies and things of that nature. Uh, you know, Barrios. Um, my primo was like, oh, we're in Saints, Rangels, Atwater. I said, all right, you know what I mean? Call it what you want. At this time, I didn't know about the beef. I didn't know about, you know, North, North and South and things of that nature. I was too young. Okay, but I guess Sal had decided that if for no other reason, they should stick to their Mexicano, Chicano roots, right? Which, hey, I'm not going to lie. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and, 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 and say that it's a bad thing, but at the same time, and I identify with sticking to your roots, man, with being proud of where you come from and where you're at. Um, so they decided that for no other reason, man, and I don't know the exact details that day or what fucking, you know, to what degree of that day it was, um, where they decided they wanted to become Serenos. So they started repping the Sioux. Now, instead of saying, okay, we're from Lo uh, Long Beach or Los or 18 or Florencia and establishing that gang there, they wanted to be a homegrown gang. So of course they started with insane Sureños and that quickly gravitated into eight town, eight town Sioux, right? Just eight town period. Um, I think they used to call themselves eight town Lux or whatever, right? But whatever the case may be, this was something that Sal and Max themselves established. Sal more so being the older brother, the big bottle, the biggest one, um, he was very intimidating. I remember he used to come to my grandmother's house and, and, you know, I've met him on several occasions and he knew me. He knew my whole family um, and just meeting them and going to their pad and knowing who he was. I knew he wasn't an individual to play with. You know, I knew he was one that was really going to establish and show people in Atwater what he was about. See, he wasn't one of these guys that just establishes a gang and then shrinks into the bushes and again, watches it from a distance and hopes the little homies go out there and hit a lick so he can shoot some carga. It was none of that. What this guy was doing was he was trying to set the foundation for the Sul, and he did. And he plays a big part in all of Northern California being established. Because for those of you that don't know, yes, there's been Sureños in San Hole and different areas in the Bay Area for a very long time, for many, many years. But... The Central Valley, the very first place to establish a stronghold and really be about that and be known for that was Atwater. And that was Sal Flores' brainchild. That was his plot, his plan. He formulated that. And to this day, it's cracking. It's cracking so much that they actually just did an operation a couple years ago, Operation a Rico operation on them. You know what I mean? The feds are on them because of what they do. So allegedly, I can't call it. Like I said, I'm not there in Atwater in them streets. I don't know. 
Um, but I will say that Sal was a very humble guy, very quiet, very cool, but had that eye of the tiger. Dun, 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 dun. You know what I mean? Orale, Apollo Creed. When you looked in his eyes, you knew that for some reason or another, this guy didn't play. Now, I'm not going to say that he went through some type of trauma as a kid because I've met his family and I could say his family were good people. Good gente, typical Mexicanos, frijoles, con arroz, menudo con queso. Oh, my. You know, I mean, there was a little bit of everything going on there and the queso fresca was popping. Um, and I remember going to barbecues at his house. You got to understand, I was a young kid. My family um, grew up simultaneously and cool with his family. So it was nothing to it but to do it. You know, of course, as we got older, I ended up catching the case and getting incarcerated. Um, so I was out of the mix of what he was doing during the 90s. But in the 90s is when it got hot and heavy. That's when gangbanging became real. And Sal put, to get, put together a whole bunch of troops and soldiers out of Atwater. And they weren't necessarily going to sit back and defend their hometown. They were going to go out there and aggressively pursue their enemies and handle their business. And they started to. Okay, like I said, it was this Vato's brainchild. He was a true gang member through and through. Okay, so this guy did time. He ended up getting incarcerated. And I remember him getting incarcerated. I had just got out of YA. I was like 18 or 19 years old. I'm out there wiggling in the streets. And I hear Sal was just getting out. Meaning he had got locked up for some type of gun case some, somewhere during the mid-90s. And he gets out and he starts to push Long Beach. Okay, I guess when he got locked up, incarcerated, wherever he went, he went back to his roots and got involved in the Long Beach carro, the Harbor Area carro in prison. Now, I don't know how that works for the Sureños, but I think maybe being an upstate Sureño at that time in the early 90s was a little bit taboo to some people. You know, there were, I, I remember running into a Vato from Sanjo and he was representing Sanjo Sul and all that. Um, but this guy maybe was a little bit taboo. So anyways, he decided to get involved with the Harbor Area car and he came out pushing Long Beach tough. And I remember a lot of his little homeboys were looking at him some type of way for that. But his brother Max had been holding it down. And Max Flores is a very, we'll, we'll profile him too. He's a different individual, right? Anyway, so what happens with Sal is Sal starts to become an obstacle in the way of a lot of these Sureños. A lot of them had respect for him for being a founder, but also a lot of him weren't really feeling his vibe because he was pushing a different narrative from what they had established or he had established and what they were rocking, which was now the upstate Sureño label, right? Um, with that being said, he started to take it from gang-related type into, uh, things into the D-gang, allegedly, right? And he started to do some uh, things in the D game. He started to become known for that. And, 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 and he, was, he was making some moves, some power moves in shower shoes, right? And um, his name became synonymous with that, with that one thing. And he started to wiggle back and forth from Mexico. Now, to what degree of wiggling he was doing, we're not going to say. But let's just say he was wiggling back and forth weekly, monthly, and yearly. To a dumb motherfucker, see clearly that I'm down. Or the NWA. So he was wiggling back and forth. And what, what happened was he ended up getting locked up. He ended up getting caught up. Okay. And I don't know what happened. I don't know what was in the cafe he drank that day when he got locked up the first time. But he decided, and the, allegedly, he decided to start um, talking a little too much. He decided to start uh, 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 to try to save himself from the chopping block, you know, from whatever time he was facing. And um, word started to circulate on the streets lightweight. You know, now, now I'm not here to disrespect this man because he because quietly as it's kept, he's no longer with us. You know, he's resting in peace, hopefully. And, you know, and I got a lot of love for Sal because I knew him as a person. He generous. He was a generous person. He was actually a very nice person, but he wasn't the type of person that you played with. You know, he was a street legend in our water and he continues to be. But um, so the word on the curb was that he was saying too much and people started to wonder. OK, and all of a sudden Sal disappeared, man. He moved out to Mexico. He went to go stay in Mexico. I was seeing a lot of uh, uh, Facebook pictures of him. He looked like he was doing well in Mexico. And somewhere along the line, he decided to come back and visit Familia in Atwater. And uh, he was going back and forth. And I guess some type of individuals or whoever felt some type of way, you know, if this guy Sal told on anyone, if he did that, you know, they said it was as vicious as, as telling on his own brother, Max, who was doing big things at the time. If that's what happened, man, I can't call it like an alcoholic. This is basically rumors, right? I'm just telling you part of his story and what, what led up into his murder. Um, then that's understandable. You know, they, these people felt some type of way and they took the initiative to go make something happen and, and take care of their own. But anyways, he goes back out to Mexico and he comes up short, right? Um, they find him dead. And I remember it was a big thing in my neighborhood. We were discussing it, me and several of my homeboys, just based on, you know, for years and years and years, we warred with Sal and Max Flores. 
with eight town you know there was always that back and forth like i said it wasn't quite to the to the point as extensive as it was between levas and atwater you know the vatos had a hatred bar none by far um past fucking the hatfields and mccoys um basically but you know every time that we would go into atwater we knew we had to be on point and be on the lookout for this sour max flores characters because um, these guys carried a lot of weight there. They had a lot of respect. They had a lot of soldados behind them. And they had built this from the ground up. Like I said, I was right there laying on my grandmother's couch, kicking back in the palpusa when I seen this happen. You know, I seen it happen, gravitate from Crips to Bloods to all the North Day thugs, right? Next thing you know, they were Sureños and it was all good. And like I said, my primo was rocking the good rhyme and he was posted up with them to the fullest. This is These are individuals that he considers friends to this day. These are individuals that he's known uh, since day one. You know, and I considered them family friends. You know, now as I, when I got older, I knew that they were the ones that if anything push came to shove, said, yeah, I was trying to peel the cat backwards, you know, and likewise, they would do me like that. Um, but it never came to that point. I remember one time, and I'll tell you a little story. Um, I'm at one of my baby mama's house, right? And she lived in Winton, right off California Street. For those of you that know, now you know. And we're posted up. And uh, she lived off California in Hall. We're chilling, we're in the front yard, and we're relaxing. Now, I know I'm out of bounds. Being an active Norteño at this time in Winton, California, and Winton's another city we'll profile eventually, um, there's a lot of food there, okay? You're just surrounded, you feel it. You, it's in the air. You can see the S in the air. It just, it's like smoke, right? And it doesn't dissipate. It's there. Um, but I didn't care at that time. Fuck you, this Merced County, homie, was de brr, dead end on mine, man. I'm posted up with a little 3-8 banger. We're chilling. You know what I mean? The, hey, it was cold that night. And I was ready for whatever. Um, but was I ready for what happened? I guess some little Southerners had walked by. They spotted my red pano. They see me and they weren't feeling the situation or what was going through my mentality. So they doubled back and they went to Salad Max Flores' house. And these motherfuckers pulled up on me in that sixth street with that flag flying, man. And I remember Sal jumping out. He was like, hey, where you from? Right? And I was like, oh, it's these cats. They didn't recognize me. You got to understand, it had been a lot of years. Yeah, about it been a lot of years since we've seen each other. It wasn't like we went and kicked back and fucking played Candyland together or ate fucking ice cream from Thrifties. It was none of that, right? Um, but we knew who each other was. And um, I was like, fuck it, it's now or never, right? So I stood up, I said, dead end, homie. It's the gun, what's happening, right? And he was like, uh, is that you? He was like, mijo, come here. You got to understand, he was like four or five years older than me. So I mobbed up like, what's up? He was like, oh, man, the little homies are tripping off you, man. He goes, it's all love, bro. He goes, remember we always said, we're going to keep it family. We're going to keep it personal. We're going to keep it real. But out there on the streets, if you're wiggling, and I go, well, so, you know, I'm not going to step on the street. I'm going to stand in the front right here on the, on the grass because I already know you just said it. He goes, Charlie. And we embraced, man. He gave me a hug. It was righteous. It was like, hey, he was like, man, stay through it, Chuck, because a lot of my younger homies, man, they're with that. They're with the business. They're with the activities. And I already knew. And I was like, don't trip. I lifted up my shirt. Do we got a problem? So am I. Um, and of course, I was trying to play the tough role because I knew it wasn't going to happen. Um, but just the love and the canalism when he showed me the embracement and the heads up, you know, he was one of those type of individuals. And that's why I wanted to profile Sal because as vicious as he could be and as smart and establishing what he did, you know, um, he was a kind, a kind hearted person in the end, whether he told or not, you know what I mean? To each man, his own, that's each man's business, man. Um, you can't hate on the next individual if you don't know what they went through and the ramifications for what's going to happen to them in the future is on them. Okay. And that's what, and that's that. Um, and like I said, it was rumors. No one knows. I just know that he did come up short, whether that was the reason or was something else behind it. So let's get one. We'll never know. Will one. Um, but I got a lot of respect for South Flores. Now I know you say to yourself right now, Gunner, uh, just because you established a gang doesn't make him a smart person or a good person. No, but it takes a man of leadership skills. It takes a man of a lot of dictation. It takes a man that's willing to put himself out there like that to do that. See, not everyone could do that. A lot of you motherfuckers don't even know how to set up a monopoly board and deal out the money. So keep it real. For someone to do something like this and to get a whole bunch of soldados and troops behind them, um, you have to have that mentality. You know, a lot of these individuals that I'm going to profile have that leadership mentality. They could have used it for bigger and better things, but they chose to use it for the gang life. And they ended up pintos, pinteros, uh, uh, convicts, inmates, so on and so forth. Oh my, you know, we won't be profiling weirdos on this channel. So don't trip. We ain't got that. They ain't got that coming. Um, we're going to keep it real over here in Gunner's Collective. I mean, in Gunner's Profiles. Bang, bang. You know, in conjunction. Anyways, with that being said, man, I hope that you go out there, move with a purpose, a fast purpose, man, and go out there and get it for your familia. You already know what it is. Um, hit that like and that thumbs up, man. Let's subscribe to Gunner's Profiles as we're going to be profiling several individuals. Again, rest in peace to South Flores, the one that started.
the upstate surreal movement. That's a fact. The gun. Bang, bang.